Hey, good morning, Temple family. It is so good to be together again here as we continue our series with Church at Home. We're going to continue this morning working our way through one of the most famous passages of Scripture in all the Bible, Psalm 23. We've looked so far at just the first verse, the Lord, like the one and only God of the universe is my shepherd. And with that reality, with that hope, I can declare with faith when life is good or not, I shall not want. Because God Almighty is the one caring for me, providing for me, and shepherding me, then I believe I will have everything I truly need and everything that is truly best for me. There's not a force in the universe that can keep what the good shepherd has destined for me from getting to me. That's the declaration of faith, I shall not want. And it really sets the tone for the whole rest of the psalm. As a matter of fact, I I read a great quote that summarized how I shall not want is really the the bedrock for the rest of this psalm by the great preacher S.M. Lockridge. And he said this, I shall not want for rest because he makes me lie down in green pastures. I shall not want for refreshment because he leads me by still waters. I shall not want for forgiveness because he restores my soul. I shall not want for guidance because he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I shall not want for companionship because even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. I shall not want for comfort because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I shall not want for provision because you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. I shall not want for joy because you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. I shall not want for anything in this life because surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall not want for anything in the next life because I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What if? What if Jesus really is enough? What if he really does satisfy the longings of our hearts? What if he really does set us free from any lesser thing that would try to give us some temporary taste of fake joy? What if he really does set us free from a lesser life? What if he really did come to give us abundant life? What if we really can declare with faith today, I shall not want. We believe that's true for all of us who dive into the reality of what it means to have such a good shepherd. Let's pray together and then let our hearts be stirred up in worship today. Father, we pray that we might experience your presence this morning. God, what we believe is best for us today. For every person watching, for every person engaged right now, we believe the best thing that could happen is for you to draw our focus towards yourself. For you to turn down all the other noises and let us hear the goodness of our God that we might taste and see that you are good. Father, please draw us to yourself today. And in that drawing, might we experience life. In that drawing, might we experience peace and rest and overwhelming hope. God, make that our reality this morning as we worship you, as we pray together, and as we hear from your word for your glory in Jesus name amen let's worship together
Thank you so much to our worship team for leading us this morning in worship. That's just awesome. We are going to dive into God's Word right now, and so I invite you to grab your Bible or whatever device you're using to, to follow along in the text. And we're trying to create kind of a, a little bit of a sense of normalcy. And we have a tradition here at Temple uh, that we've not done the last couple weeks while we've been on video, but we want to jump back into that today. And so if, if you're new, if, if you've just been kind of tagging along since we've been doing this church at home quarantine style kind of a thing, uh, then you might not know that, that each week before we dive into this book, we have set a collective creed for years together here at Temple about what we believe this book is. And then a, it's a prayer that kind of prepares our heart. And so I know this is awkward and like we're at home or whatever, but like I want you to say this along with me today, right? Like let's, let's actually say this together. And, and I know you probably don't actually like have your Bible in a concordance and your journal spread out on your coffee table and kneeling down before it like I every pastor probably wishes their people are doing. I know you're like eating Pop-Tarts in your underwear right now, but engage for just a minute and let's declare this with some conviction together this morning. The Bible is the word of God. The truth of the Bible will change my life. Lord, open my heart and awaken my mind and give me grace to respond. Change me for your glory and my joy. Amen. Now Emily's going to read Psalm 23 as we dive back in together. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thanks so much, Emily. Awesome job. As we're going to work phrase by phrase through the second and third verse this morning, we start by just focusing in on, he makes me lie down in green pastures. That's where we'll kind of park first. And we're not going to talk a ton about the green pastures or even about the still waters necessarily, or we'd be here for a really long time. Although you got nowhere to go, but still, we're not going to be here all that long. I really want to focus first on this idea of he makes me lie down. He makes me. Now, as the baby of the family, growing up with two older brothers, there were multiple times that my brothers told me to do something, and I bowed up at them and said, make me. And here's the thing about my brothers. They were really willing to make me. Like, they, I think they wanted me to do that. Of course, when I dared them to make me, and then they did, I would scream really loud, and then they would get in trouble for beating me up, because that's the beauty of being the baby brother, right? But here, there's this idea that it's it's God. <laughs> Remember back to the Lord, Yahweh. Yahweh is making us lie down in green pastures. And, and, and we're being reminded here of, of this analogy of shepherd, sheep, right? And here's the thing about sheep. Sheep are not known to be like the smartest animal there is right? Like when, when we're compared to sheep, it's not necessarily a compliment, right? Like if you're thinking, oh, they're so soft and wooly. I don't really think that's totally what's meant in the analogy or the word picture here. Sheep have to be told to stop and to rest. And, and there's some interesting things I read about sheep's response to resting. And one of the things that, that I read is a, a sheep, when it's nervous, when it's afraid, it actually locks its legs. Like it, it does like the deer in the headlights kind of a thing. It just freezes. And what I think is some of us are in a season right now in life where we're frozen in fear. And we have a loving shepherd who's coming right now into our life and he's drawing us to rest in him, to trust him enough to lie down, <laughs> believing that the good shepherd will always lead us to pasture. The other response that sheep have is not when they're afraid, but when they're threatened. So what I read is, because they're kind of in the goat family, when a sheep is threatened, they lower their head and they'll just start running. <laughs> they will ram their head up against whatever they think is threatening them. And I got to be honest, 
when I find myself in a difficult position, I've had that habit in my life of just beating my head against a brick wall, trying to make something happen. I can't tell you the number of times in in recent eyes, over 20 years of marriage, that I've been trying to force something that wasn't God's timing or wasn't what he'd chosen for us. And I'm pounding my head against this brick wall, trying to tell her, look at the open door the Lord is giving us. And she's like, you're bleeding in your giant forehead, dude. Stop pounding your head against the brick wall. And the best thing that could happen in those moments where we're trying to force something to happen is for a good shepherd to intervene. (laughs) For him to say, stop. I want you to rest. I want you to lie down in green pastures. And here's the thing. In, in some of those really motivated moments of life, um, I have some actual footage of my response to God telling me that he's going to make me lie down. Here it is. That's my response to God telling me to chill out. <laughs> No, I want to do something. I I have to pretend that I'm being productive. The most loving thing he does is say, no, there's a green pasture here. Here's the thing about the green pasture, and this is all we'll really focus on about the pasture part, is a sheep lying down in a green pasture. The picture being painted is that the sheep has already fed. They shall not want. (laughs) They've already been taken care of. And it's a green pasture, meaning whenever they wake up from that nap, there's still going to be plenty of provision for the next chapter too. And if I really trust that God is who he says he is, that his care will be what he says it will be, then I can take a breath. I can rest. It would be really unloving of God to make us lie down if he didn't have this under control, right? Think of the times maybe when when parents, you, you had younger kids and all of a sudden something rough was going on in your life. And you kind of faked your way through the the good night routine and and you told your kids, it's going to be okay. But you didn't know that for sure. And after you crept out of their bedroom, maybe you sat in the living room together with your spouse and and you worried. You wondered what's going to happen. But what we believe about our good shepherd is he's never told us to lie down and then gone to chew on his fingernails. (laughs) He's got this. We can trust him. We can lie down and rest because he really is the good shepherd. He really is in control. And I think one of the benefits of, of this particular season of life right now is many of us have been forced into some margin. We've been forced to slow our pace down. Some of us hate it. I, I, I'm hearing from some of you that you can't wait to get back to a really full schedule. But many of you, more of you than not, have told me you've been shocked how good it's been to breathe, to have your evenings together as a family. You can't believe how fast your pace of life had been. You didn't even realize it until you were forced to slow down. And my heart is just burning in that for you. As a matter of fact, I'm working on a sermon for when we get back together about what needs to not go back to normal when all of this is over. This morning, what I would focus on is Listen, I don't think we're living a healthy pace of life. And I think part of a benefit, a gift of this right now has been that our shepherd has made some of us lie down. He's made some of us focus on the fact that if he's not guiding us, we don't know where we're going to end up. We kind of have no option but faith. We have no option but to trust him. He's inviting us into the rest of his presence. He's inviting us to be still and know that he is God. Here's the thing, in the economy of the one true God, there's great value in taking a nap and just chilling out, lay down, breathe. I was reminded just this week about the creation story from a perspective that I tend to forget about the the magnitude of day six in creation. God creates us. He creates mankind. And in that creating gives this this command to have dominion and to to rule over the world. And then he makes the woman and brings her to the man. Adam is delighted the whole way down into his soul, finally. And, And then God says, again, this dominion command and adds to it, be fruitful and multiply. And then he says, hey, tomorrow's a really important day. Here's what we're gonna do tomorrow. We're taking the day off. 
The, the first full day after we were created was a day off. The, the idea of entering into Sabbath rest right after we got purpose, right after we understood our calling, right after we were given dominion. And he says, no, the best thing you can do is not go do something for me. It's to be with me. I created you to, to be with me and find your life there, not in the, the job I've given you to do. Your purpose is me. He invites us to find in him more than enough. And there's nowhere we see that pictured better than in the life of Jesus. I read this great book at the very beginning of quarantine, and, and there's one sentence from the book I cannot shake. Author, his name is John Mark Comer, and he said this, if you want the life of Jesus, you must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. He doesn't mean sinless perfection. <laughs> he meant the pattern of life. If we want to enjoy the life of Jesus, then we have to look at how he lived, how he interacted with people, how he handled his calling, if we're going to enjoy the benefits of his life. So quick reminder, I told you we talk about this each week in this series. Don't forget this is all about Jesus. Remember in John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. But in the verse before that, in the, in the phrase right before that, the end of John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And I believe if we want to experience that life, the abundant life, then we need to look at the life pattern, the lifestyle of Jesus. And here's the, the pattern. Here's the lifestyle of Jesus. Consistent retreating from the noise. Consistent turning down the volume and connecting with the Father. In, in the Gospel of Luke, which gives us the most detailed look at the life of Jesus, nine times in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus went to a solitary place or a quiet place, a place away where he was kind of in social distancing so that he could connect with the Father. The lifestyle of Jesus is to again and again and again be refreshed and to lie down in green pastures with his heavenly Father. And can you imagine this? Can you imagine a super stressed out Jesus? <laughs> can you picture Jesus being annoyed with everybody like, Mary Magdalene, where's the olive oil? You know, like barking at him like the way I do with my kids. Can you imagine him being like, where in the world? Why did you forget that way? Or, or being checked out? Can you imagine Jesus being like, not right now, I'm busy. <laughs> I'd heal your leg, but I got to be somewhere I'm running late, right? Let Thaddeus handle that. No, nobody's ever heard of Thaddeus, but I'm sure he'll do fine, right? Uh, go talk to Judas. Just don't give him any money. You'll never get it back. Like him blowing people off, him being in a rush, him being short-tempered and grumpy. None of us picture Jesus that way. We see in the life of Jesus that he was never in such a hurry that he wouldn't look somebody in the eye. He was never in such a hurry that he didn't have time to look in need square in the face. We don't see this pace of life in Jesus that I constantly see in myself. The fact is, if many of us were Jesus, we would just be constantly repeating his first public miracle. We'd be like, oh, I need some more wine, right? Where's the water? We're so stressed. We're rushed so much. And we see in the life of Jesus this, this constant slowing down of his pace. And what we're finding out is, because we don't model the lifestyle of Jesus, it's making us sick. Psychologists and mental health professionals continue to write and blog and publish articles about a sickness that they believe is an epidemic in our modern culture. It's called hurry sickness. As in, they've labeled it a disease that we're in such a hurry, it's making us sick. Hurry sickness is defined as this, a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. That literally just describes my life. <laughs> like, that we're always, oh, I'm running late for something. I forgot to do something. I got to do this. Oh, no, what if this doesn't turn out right? That that's a sickness. It's making us sick. And it's not good for our bodies. So let me tell you this story about a world-renowned cardiologist. His name is, is Dr. Meyer Friedman, right? Dr. Meyer Friedman uh, became a really famous cardiologist a generation ago. And here was his discovery. It doesn't sound very, uh, spoiler alert, very earth-shattering, okay? 
he discovered that type A people, people who are wound really tight, who want to accomplish a lot, who are always a little bit angry and in way too much of a hurry, he discovered they are more prone to a heart attack. Duh. <laughs> like it made him world famous to come up with this discovery. And what he said is these patients display an unhealthy sense of time urgency. <laughs> That's what he's quoted as saying. He changed the, the cardiovascular world with this awareness, an unhealthy sense of time urgency. I think that describes a lot of our lives. But here's the thing. Dr. Friedman made this discovery, wait for it, in the 1950s. <laughs> like, straight up leave it to beaver days, right? Like, when the world was still in black and white, when everything operated at such a slow pace that I don't even like watching modern movies about the 1950s. He said, man, there's a sickness in our culture. We're just in too much of a hurry. And what we're in desperate need of is a good shepherd who will intervene and tell us lay down, to chill out, to breathe, to just have him for a moment, to slow our pace. I believe that for every reason, good and bad reasons, that we are distracting ourselves into spiritual coldness, into spiritual drift. It's not that we are against spiritual things, we're just too busy for it. It's not that, that we think it's not important. It's just that we have all these other pressing demands weighing on us so heavy that we're not pursuing the things of the Lord. And it's, it's, it's that we're, we're not so much bad, we're just busy. It's not that we're evil, we're just distracted. And, and the, the end result is this distraction, this restlessness is wrecking our spiritual life. Our spiritual lives are, are, are what's hanging on by a thread. And what we really need is for God to make us lie down. To, to draw us to himself. T.S. Eliot said, we are distracted by distraction from distraction. <laughs> that, that we're constantly being distracted away from the rest that is found in him. This picture continues. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, the rest of the verse says. And, and the, the idea of still waters is, is a beautiful thing. It, it, it means that he gets us to what we need most. This is a whisper again back to, I shall not want. See, a sheep is made up of 70% water. They need a lot of water. The problem is, sheep are terrible swimmers. And if they haven't been trimmed, all of that wool makes them sink. <laughs> They're not good swimmers to begin with. So what they need most actually is really difficult for them to get to. They need somebody to get them to what they need most. That's what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd gets us to what we really need most. He'll lay down his life to make sure we can have it. He leads us beside still waters. And here I want to focus on this idea of he leads me. And, and, and I, I want to park there for a minute. The, the mission statement is, at Temple is that we exist to guide people to life change in Jesus Christ. We believe that following Jesus means being led, that there is movement, that there's a trajectory of our life that changes when we follow him, that, that Jesus meets us where we are, he just loves us too much to leave us there. He wants to lead us, that he's drawing us forward. Whether, whether we've been following Jesus for five minutes or five months or five years or five decades, he's not leaving us where we are. When we're following the good shepherd, where we are isn't what defines us. It's not where he intends to leave us. Maybe you've heard it said your current situation isn't your permanent destination. And if we're following the Good Shepherd, that's true. He will continue to lead us until He has led us finally to our eternal home, to His very presence. Here's how I would say that. If you're still living, He's still leading. His, his role as a Good Shepherd is to continue to lead us. And if He really is the Good Shepherd, then it's good news that He's in charge of where we're going. It's good news that He wants to continue to, to pull us forward. Listen recently to a, a sermon by Louis Giglio. He said, 
everybody has a shepherd. That, that first declaration, the Lord is my shepherd, just means we've chosen a better shepherd. For some of us, what other people think of us is what guides us, what leads us. For some of us, a certain level of, of, of success in our career, that's our shepherd. For some of us, outrunning the opinion of our family of origin or the, the wounds of our family of origin, that's what shepherds us and guides us and leads us. We're all being led. And if, if our response is, nobody's the boss of me, nobody's going to make me lie down, nobody's going to lead me, well, then what that means is you must think you're your own shepherd. I got to be honest with you, I make a way better sheep than I do shepherd. I want to trust the good shepherd to lead me. I don't want any lesser thing to lead my life and govern my life. He leads us beside still waters, which, let's be honest, is a statement of faith. The last couple months haven't felt like still waters, right? Like a class five whitewater rapid where we're just hanging on in the middle of the boat for dear life. We ain't even rowing. We're the guy that everybody else in the boat's yelling at because we're not doing our, like, that's what it's felt like. But when we have trust, when we have faith, when we have hope in the goodness of the good shepherd, then we believe this water is a lot more still than it feels like. It's a lot more still than it looks like because he's good. He never puts his sheep in a place where he will not care for them. And I love this. I want to say this before we move to verse 3. God willing, next Sunday we'll look at verse 4, which is walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And I just want to point out, here's how much God loves you. Before he walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death, he invites you to lie down in green pastures. He leads you beside still waters because he's after your soul, which sets the stage for verse number three. He restores my soul. All of his leading, all of his making of us lie down is because we serve a God who desperately wants the health, the restoration of our souls. He's after our true spiritual being, the soul, the true us, the, the us deep down on the inside. He wants to restore that. You're never past restoration in the economy of God. He wants to bring your soul back to you. Heal, whole, and restore. That's the mission statement of the good shepherd. That's what he's after. The reason that he wants us to lie down, the reason he wants us to sit down beside some still waters, the reason he's inviting us to, to create the margin, to actually connect with him, is because he's desperate for the wellness of your soul. I want to share a quote with you from Henry Nguyen, a renowned theologian from a generation ago. But this is a little blunt, but I think it's really good for us today. He says, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside some time to be with God and listen to Him. Now notice, he didn't say if we set aside time to read our Bible and pray. <laughs> no, to really connect with the living God, like the, the lion down in green pastures kind of connect with just Him. He said we, we can't really enjoy the abundant life, the spiritual life, the life offered in Jesus, the life he purchased for you with his own body and blood. We can't enjoy that if we're not creating the space to connect with him. Last spring, Marisa bought a vine in a big pot that's been sitting on our back porch. And, and there's miracle in that vine because it didn't die. It's still alive. We, we have a really good gift in the Rife household of of even killing fake plants. Like, it's just not real good. But this, this vine has, it survived the whole winter. But one of the things that she has mentioned lately is we've got to get a larger trellis for it. The vine has outgrown the little trellis that came with it. Because here's the thing about a vine. If it outgrows its trellis, it eventually will die. It won't thrive. It won't flourish. And, and what I believe that discipline of setting aside time to truly connect with God, not do some religious performanceism, truly connecting with God, that's the trellis that a spiritual life can flourish within. 
One of the things that many of you have told me, you've had more time with God during this quarantine than you did before. What I'm challenging with right now, before any uh, uh, decrees are issued to begin opening stuff back up, I'm challenging you, begin to set aside time right now where you say, nothing's going to take this time away from my green pasture time. Nothing's going to take away my still water time. I have found in it rest beyond measure. And it has restored my soul. We can't truly live a spiritual life without it. And if, if that practice doesn't find its way into our schedules, it's never going to find its way into our souls. That discipline. The, the real danger, I think, for most of us is not that we will renounce our faith and deny our faith. I, I think the danger is that we'll be so busy, we'll just live a lesser faith. We won't enjoy a thriving faith. We'll let so many other things cloud that out that we'll be in survival mode, that we will skim our lives, as John Ortberg says, instead of actually living them. This, this restoration of the soul reminds me of the prophet Elijah. A year ago, we talked about this, this season of life he found himself in, the darkest season of life he'd ever experienced. He wanted nothing more than to lie down in green pastures. He wanted nothing more then some still waters. He wanted nothing more than the restoration of his soul. And he begged for God to meet with him. And it says that God sent a mighty wind to blow, so strong that it split a mountain. So it's probably more like a massive tornado. But First King says God was not in the wind. Then God sent an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. Then God sent a fire. It says God was not in the fire. And then... Elijah heard a whisper and he instantly fell to his knees and he was experiencing in that whisper the restoration of his soul. And here's the thing, I, theologically that text kind of wigs me out a little bit because God can't not be in an earthquake or a wind or fire. God is everywhere. The psalmist said, if I make my bed in the, in the house of the dead, you're there. God is everywhere. So he was in that tornado it's just not where he was going to reveal himself. He was in that earthquake. He can't help but be. That's just not where he wanted to reveal himself. And he was in the fire. Our God is a consuming fire. But he wants to reveal himself in the whisper. The kind of whispers that happen when we lie down together in green pastures. He's inviting you to the whisper. What's at stake here in the whisper isn't just our emotional health in our physical health, in our relational health, as if that weren't enough. What's at stake here is life, our spiritual life. If we cannot allow God to make us lie down, we're truly not going to flourish. We're truly not going to live the life he has intended for us. So here we have the phrase again, the next part of the verse is, he's leading us again. He leads me in the path of righteousness. Righteousness is a, a big churchy word that might seem complicated, but the best description is actually found in the New Living Translation of this phrase. The New Living Translation says, he guides me along right paths. I don't know anything about shepherding sheep, but I'm told they can't stay in one place. They've got to constantly be moving. And here's the thing about moving from one place to another. You need to be on the right path to get there. And some of us right now are in a season of life. We're not sure how we're going to get from this season to the next season. And here's good news. If we will yield, if we will follow, if we will trust the shepherd, he keeps us on the right path. It's what he does. A good shepherd always keeps his sheep on the right path. We can follow him. And the only thing I'll say here before we move on is, is I want to speak again. I said this last week, so I won't say much here, but Here's the thing about the good shepherd. He never asks his sheep to walk somebody else's path. You don't need to walk somebody else's path. You don't need to walk the path of that mom whose social media presence makes her look like super mom. You don't need to walk that path. That's not the path he has for you. You don't need to walk the path of the guy that's got it all together, has every answer for when this is going to end and what life is going to look like next. You don't need to walk that path. 
I don't need to walk the path of the megachurch pastor with the billion dollar budget. No, God's just called us to walk our path, the path that he has prepared for us. There's such freedom in that. And there's bondage in trying to walk somebody else's path. You know, if I trust the good shepherd and believe that he's enough, I'm set free from the comparison game to anybody else's pathway. He leads me in the right path, the right path for me. How freeing, how life giving that is. And he does all of this. Here's the crucial conclusion here. For his name's sake. It's all about the glory of his name. It's all about the praise of his name. This psalm is about the good shepherd, not the good sheep. (laughs) This isn't about how much we got it together. That's what religion is about. Following the good shepherd is all about him. He's enough. He's the one who's righteous. I'm just a busted up stinky sheep just following him. It is all about him. And it always will be about him. And the more I center my life on his glory, the more I find my soul is satisfied. That that God really is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That's how this works, that our life would be centered on him. True life is only found in living for a cause greater than ourselves, living for his glory. And here's the thing. Living for his praise begins with living in his presence and being satisfied by that. Living for his renown begins with being satisfied in him alone. That's where we're invited to run towards, that we'd create the margin to reach for him, to to rest in him, to, to lie down in the green pastures that he has provided. Remember, if If we want to experience the life of Jesus, then we need to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus, which is frequent connections with the Father. Away from the noise and away from the crazy, just connecting with the living God. So this this statistic that I'm about to give is is BC. It's before COVID. So I I don't know how much this statistic has probably increased since then, but research prior to the last couple months, says that the average iPhone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times per day. Not per week, (laughs) per month. 2,000, 2,000 times a day. And and the thing about touching our phone 2,617 times a day is I think that's probably increased. Or maybe it's actually gone down because we never put it down now. (laughs) Maybe it's just one continual uh, phone in our hand from the time that we wake up. But here's here's why I mentioned that statistic. This this is what's been on my heart with this whole being satisfied and and resting in him is it makes me think of of another psalm. Psalm 16, verse number eight. The psalmist said, I have set the Lord always before me. I've set the Lord always before me. It's what I constantly look towards. Not constantly checking my phone, constantly checking if somebody has liked something. I'm looking towards him. He's always before me. And I know this is this is like what a monk would do. But just imagine, what if 2,617 times a day I looked towards Jesus? What if 2,600 and, and 17 times a day, whatever the number, that I'm just focused on him, that I'm just drawn towards him. Okay, a tenth of that. Like, what if 261 times a day I put my mind towards him? How much more peace would I feel? How much more rest? How much of a trellis would that be so that the vine of my spiritual life could flourish? That I'd keep him before me. And I believe that takes discipline and that takes commitment. And I am just begging you, please don't waste this moment. Begin to build some muscle memory to the goodness of him and him alone. I know for some of you watching, your pace of life hasn't changed much. You're you're an essential worker and you've still had to go to work. And for some of you, your life has gotten more complicated because you're doing that and you're homeschooling. I understand that. But what I know for sure for all of us is our routine has been interrupted. In one way or another, something has interrupted the the rat race. And what I'm begging you is look to him. You know, the word pastor means shepherd. I'm just a sheep 
that's called the shepherd. But because I'm a fellow sheep, here's what I know. I know there's nothing better for you than Jesus. I want nothing more in the world than for you to find hope in him. I want nothing more in the world than for you to be more satisfied in him than anything else this world has to offer. And I pray with all my heart that you won't miss this opportunity to believe a little deeper in your soul that he alone can satisfy you, that he alone offers the hope and the faith to rest, to lie down in green pastures, to, to sit beside still waters and to experience the restoration of your soul. I promise you he will lead you in the right path. He's worth trusting. He's worth trusting first and foremost with our eternity. If you don't know for sure that you have a relationship with God, that, that you believe you'll go to heaven one day, that, that you believe that your separation from God is forgiven, if you don't know that for sure, then the first link by this video is, is an opportunity for you to connect with one of us. One of our pastors or staff would love to just have a conversation with you about how you can know for sure that you have this kind of relationship that I've been talking about with Jesus. If you do know that's your reality, Oh, then my encouragement is press into that. Lean into that. Pursue that like you never have before because that's where life is found. Let me pray for us. Father, your love is enough. When everything else falls away, we trust that your love will endure. You are faithful and you are good. And we are grateful that you've invited us to follow you to follow you where we can rest, we can experience peace, and we can find hope. May that be true for each of us today, more in the next season than this, because you will continue to lead us until you call us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us. I love you, and I can't wait to see you soon. Let's worship together.
Happy Sunday, Temple. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Pastor Doug and our worship team uh, for an incredible time together. Uh, we hope God spoke to your heart and you're leaving uh, your living room uh, different than when you walked into it this morning. Uh, we want to give you a couple of things before we head out on a beautiful Sunday. Uh, the first thing is that link that Pastor Doug mentioned just a couple of seconds ago, uh, ago which is Can We Talk? Uh, so if there's anything heavy on your heart, anything you'd like to be able to talk through, uh, please click on that. Let us know. We'd love to be able to talk through those things with you. Uh, we also have the link for our Temple Kids uh, as well as the parent guide. So be sure to click on that and, uh, and, and watch that uh, together. Have a blast. Uh, your kids are going to absolutely love that. Uh, speaking of which, we've also been updating our daily connection link um, every single day with fresh content. Uh, for, for kids. And so if you haven't been clicking on those, you can go to the Facebook page. That link is updated every single day. It's on our app. It's also in the email. Uh, please take advantage of that. Uh, tons of stuff for families to do together. And so um, make sure you're checking on that. Uh, fast forward a little bit into the week. We've got TSM Live on Instagram on Wednesday at seven o'clock. Uh, so any of our students come on. Uh, it's going to be a blast. You're going to want to uh, be there together. Uh, we've also got at the very uh, bottom there, some of the links we have, the how uh, can we help? Uh, if there's anything you guys need, anything that uh, you're willing to, to give maybe to somebody else, please click on that. Let us know how we can help be the church to each other. And finally, our online giving link is at the very bottom as you continue to be faithful to give. We love you so much. We cannot wait to see you so soon. God bless.